Welcome to Beyond Human. This is our twelfth session. As far as I can tell, this is our last session, but that might change. My feeling is that it will be our last session of this series. <coughs> we want to get right on with the series. We have some things to talk about that kind of round out our our whole uh, close up or our summary, our bottom line. And I want to introduce to you Jim on my left, who will be helping me with this session, and his partner Glenn on my right. And I'm going to uh, ask that they uh, feed me questions as we have prepared our little outline, hopefully in accordance with my older member's instruction. So let's get right to it. And <coughs> Jim, what is our first question on our list? Did we want to say more about the generic versus the religious terminology? Yes, we, we discussed it on one of our previous sessions. I think the important thing here is <coughs> that we realize that what we now call religious terminology, as far as that those terms that we associate with the Bible, with the background of the Old and New Testament, the terminology used at one time or at its origin or as it was given to humanity as the next level was present with those individuals, it was not religious terminology. It was generic terminology. It's because of the passage of time and because of the lack of closeness of the next level that the vocabulary and the terminology, the vernacular, so to speak, has become religious terminology and tainted and less than true, less than accurate. I have to bring up again that when T, my older member, when T said the first time to me, the next level, our computer said, well, you know, people aren't going to understand something like a reference to the next level. What does that mean? And yet if we, instead of saying the next level, we say the human kingdom, we get into religious terminology. We get into a, a degree of spirituality that is less than real, less than true. So an attempt to get to true objective terminology, the next evolutionary level or the evolutionary level above human. Remember, human, evolutionary level. Evolutionary level above human. This whole series is about beyond human, synonymous with evolutionary level above human. There is no clearer terminology that we're aware of than evolutionary level above human. Rem I'm reminding you, you, the use of the term evolution there has nothing to do with Darwin and his theories or his principles. It has to do with life as we can discuss it in the science te textbooks, in biology or zoology, as kingdom levels and evolutionary levels animal kingdom, animal evolutionary level, human evolutionary level, evolutionary level above human. And we've also discussed that the soul, whether we like it or have trouble with it or not, depending upon our listener or our viewer who may have difficulty with some concept of reincarnation, and let me remind you not to apply some of the concepts of reincarnation you may have heard of, but there is a type of reincarnation that we have told you is certainly for real. I mean, did not Jesus take a human vehicle if he had pre-existence? Had he never had a vehicle before he took that vehicle? Yes, he had had a vehicle before he took that vehicle. Was he not a member with the vehicle in our Father's kingdom before he took that vehicle? So he reincarnated, even though he his, his task was worse than that. He had to incarnate down a kingdom level or down an evolutionary level in order to take the vehicle that we call 
called Jesus. So the reason we discuss the generic as against the religious terminology is try to help bridge the gap. Some individuals, you know, recently we had someone who is going to join the classroom and said, but I really have trouble with the Bible. I have trouble with uh, religious uh, concepts, with religious terminology, because in my childhood and my background, the history, I was so turned off by it. And so with that individual, we can talk the generic terms. We can talk evolutionary level above human. We can talk everything else that we talk doesn't seem to give much problem. But when we say things like Father, or when we say Kingdom of Heaven, or we say Kingdom of God, because of being run away from those terms, because of bad experiences, they came a, became a problem for that individual. Now, that individual has to overcome that problem. But in the same sense, we have to appreciate that fact, and we can even understand why someone would be turned off by that kind of terminology. And here is the other extreme of that is someone who is so into religious terminology that that's what connects, and they have to overcome that. They have to rise above the religious terminology and be willing to see the truth in the generic terminology without any hang-up either way, just seeking a clear understanding of how God's program of growth and development, both for the vehicles and for the souls, was designed. And so that's the reason we have to address the issue for you again, because it doesn't matter your, what your prior orientation was as far as understanding of terms or your background. These are just some of the hurdles we have to make. We, so we try to kind of walk both sides of the fence. For those who came from the religious background, we try to help them connect by using those terms. And yet when we do, we try to also supplement them with more generic terms for those who had bad experiences and were turned off by those. So I think enough said on that topic. Uh, Glenn, what's the next one on our questions? Well, did we want to discuss the different routes to the classroom and maybe the two extremes that you mentioned? Yes, we do, and I'm glad you asked that question. Now, what he means by the different routes to the classroom, and we're using classroom here synonymously with when individuals or souls are in an overcoming process, when they are on their way out of the human kingdom, on their way in the kingdom or the evolutionary level above human. Now, the reason we're discussing the extreme routes here is to give you some understanding of what happens to a soul during its awareness of the closeness of the next level. It's quite obvious that the next level has to be very close at this time and has been since uh, early 70s, has certainly been extremely close to this planet and to varying degrees uh, to different areas dependent upon who we're talking about, individuals and what presence is. But since it has been close, people respond in a different way. You know, there's an analogy here that might be helpful. Uh, most of us have seen close encounters of the third kind. There's a scene in there, and uh, sometimes I wish that we had a great big picture of, of a shot that was on a helicopter there, where there were all these individuals that for some, or for differing reasons, had to go to Devil's Tower. They they were led to Devil's Tower. They didn't know why, they didn't know what, but that's where they had to go. They were compelled to go. Now, some went intellectually because of, like some of the scientists who went intellectually. They were hearing beep beeps and they had kind of a communication with um, the physical reality of, of certain ones uh, outside of this Earth's age of the human kingdom as we know it. And so, they, from an intellectual or a technical or a pragmatic uh, approach, they went to Devil's Tower because of their curiosity and their interest in what they might find there. Others didn't even know why they had to go there, but they had to go there. Now, 
The same parallel exists as souls prepare themselves for overcoming or this transition from human kingdom to the level above human. Some might hear these tapes and the information that they hear, it makes sense to them and they say, I've been waiting for this, I know that it's right. Others might merely hear five seconds of it and that's all it takes and they say, I know this, this is what I've been waiting for. Some might hear the whole thing and it take them a long time and they're not quite so sure. Different degrees of preparedness, meaning different degrees of preparedness from previous experiences. But before we get into that, let's talk a moment about another extreme. Might be someone who has left everything behind, such as a street person. And for some reason or other, he could not be motivated to reconstruct his place in society. Even though he tried, it just didn't work. He couldn't muster up enough motivation. And he fell into guilt because his life was falling apart and he didn't know what to do about it. He didn't want to become a street person. He finds himself there. We feel that our, our monastery, our classroom for overcoming, our classroom for this transition, is monastery-shelter. It is monastery hyphen home for street people. But th those street people who might come by that route, as we called it, into this classroom would live exactly by the same rules, the same training program, the same everything in preparedness for it. They have to do the complete overcoming task is what we're getting at. So it doesn't really matter because some of those from the streets might be more like some of those on that helicopter in Close Encounters who didn't know why they were there. It was almost like subconscious or what some people would call it a subconscious uh, psychical le level of tuning into that they had to do it. And it could be at the subconscious that some individuals, some souls, or find themselves at our doorstep not knowing why. And then after they step in and learn why, it all fits. Others might know all the why, and then when they learn the particulars about it, they end up with exactly the same difficulty, exactly the same problems or lessons or areas of overcoming, degree of overcoming necessary, as those who came from a standpoint of knowledge or information. So here are two extreme routes, one who might come in having nothing and ones who come up here and have to give up everything. What's the difference? They both lost everything. They both left everything in order to enter the transition of preparedness to move into that kingdom level. When we first had this information in 1975 and gave it for a short time for those who responded then it was the butterfly the caterpillar becoming butterfly transition and we used that illustration and the metamorphic illustration even though we know it had little pitfalls because it made us too uh, aware or too focused on the physical aspect of that uh, metamorphosis instead of the soul. Not that they aren't both equally a part of it, but the point is that the change, it's just like that caterpillar has to drop when it enters that, enters that chrysalis. The chrysalis being the classroom. The classroom, the overcomer's classroom. That is the chrysalis. I can't get in that chrysalis and get on with my change until I have dropped everything outside that chrysalis. Now I can step in that chrysalis and still have thoughts of caterpillar activity, but I have to abort them, abort them, abort them until there is no caterpillar activity. And so the same would be true from whichever route you approach to the classroom or the chrysalis or the transitional overcomers route from the human 
evolutionary level into the evolutionary level above human, the house of the Most High God, whichever is your terminology. They are both accurate. They are both real. Did we leave anything out of that one, Glenn? No, I think that covered it very well. Okay, Jim, you're next. Let's go to the next question. Well, I know you touched a little bit on this about the street people, but what about the addicts, the sexaholics, and the alcoholics, etc.? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it's the same. It's the same issue. You know, if at a subconscious level, I can't get with the, or I become, I am somehow unsatisfied with what the world has to offer. I can't really play all of the human so-called ideal ways. I can't just be a good husband, a good father, bring home a good wage, have good insurance policy, pay for my grave, pay for the trust that would take care of everyone behind me. And, and I, I just, I did it all right. I even took care of the ending. It was all covered. If I can't get into that, and I know that there's something more than that, because that's where I am. I'm ready for something more. Maybe some souls aren't ready for something more. And therefore, that is satisfactory. But for those souls who know there is something more, and they don't know what it is, and they don't know why they're in this time lock or this waiting period, what is it that I'm supposed to find that I'm not finding? I'm hunting here, I'm hunting there. Who can't understand while you're in that agony and that anxiety why you wouldn't find yourself a sexaholic, an alcoholic, into drugs, into losing respect for career, losing respect for some of those aspects that, that society says you must do. Now, I'm not justifying our participating in activity that is against the law or would disturb others or interfere with others or would make trouble for others or with the legal system with, in which we live. But I certainly can see that, I'll, I'll be honest with you, if I did not have this knowledge in my conscious mind and my pursuit underway and my awareness of what I am pursuing, and my even subconscious awareness of the value of what I am pursuing, it would be hard for me not to be an addict of some sort. Maybe not to any hard degree or any a degree that would find me ready for a hospital, but why not? I mean, you need pacifiers of some sort if you can't connect with what it is that you're looking for what it is that's missing in your life. And that's certainly understandable. Did that clarify that for you, yes. Jim? Okay, anything more on that one? No. I think okay. It. Glenn, let's go to the next one. Okay. We want to talk about the symptoms of those who are more ready for this and possibly how if they have more symptoms, is it an indication that they had done a lot of overcoming at a previous time? Yes, and that just picks up right where we left off on mm -hmm. the last one because talking about symptoms and degrees of symptoms of readiness or ripeness for picking. I'm talking about for the next level to pick a soul so that when it picks that soul, then it is ready to make that transition. Well, you know, in, in um, 1975 when our around that time when the information first came out, some of these who are in this classroom, and by the way, sitting in this studio with us at this moment, they, some of them had their backpack. And that's all they had. They'd already left everything. They didn't know, didn't know why, but they had a backpack. And they, they didn't feel like they were just a, a hippie who was uh, just out on a trek of, of uh, a worthlessness. They just didn't know why they found them. Even some with their backpack found themselves even physically within a few miles of the area of where T and I first surfaced 
with the information that was given to us to give. So those who find themselves with that degree of readiness, uh, with no question in their mind, they, they had not gotten into family, they did not have children, they did not have properties they had to get rid of, they didn't have this, they didn't have that. Now I'm not criticizing those who maybe had those things and rose to, when they recognized this information, that they had to also pursue it. But we're discussing the degree of readiness. Now I'll have to be honest with you here, that I, I feel that the indication or some indications of the degree of that readiness might be because those same souls received so much overcoming lessons in the previous time that a representative was here. Now, we have to just face that, talk about it openly, even though that does a little tilt to some of our computers. When the next level sent Jesus as a representative, don't forget his only purpose in being here was to, what? Spread the news of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom, the, the kingdom of heaven is in our midst. In other words, the door is open. You listen to me, you do what I say, you can get in. If you don't do it to that degree that you can get in and stay there, then you'll have to be born again. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that everyone in this classroom was there or had to be born again, but I can't help but believe my older member as my older member explains to me that those souls were present at that time with him, knew him, did as he taught to the best of their ability, accomplished a great deal of their overcoming, and therefore when they came in at this time, they knew not to get into this, not to get into that, and their baggage was light, their yoke was easy, their burden was light, they were more prepared to move right on and, and get with their overcoming. Now, <clears throat> here again I've got to say this is not to put someone down who finds that their yoke is not light and their burden is not easy or vice versa, whichever way it's supposed to be. Because we can, anyone who finds this and connects with this and knows that this is the truth, if they really know that it is the truth, and the more they know it is the truth, the closer they probably were, if not accurately were, with him 2,000 years ago. The more they knew him, the more they knew his father through his mouth. Because Jesus did not want them to know him. He wanted them to know his Father. He wanted to be a vessel of his Father's mind, and so forth up the line to God Almighty or the Chief of Chiefs, the Creator of Creators. So back to the question at point here is the symptoms of readiness can frequently be seen by the ease with which we can drop things or how much we are already in a position to jump right into the classroom, get on with the overcoming. Now, even those who came in with backpack and had already prepared themselves by not getting into those things, that didn't mean they had an easy road to plow. There is, as far as I know of, or as far as T and I know of, there is no row to plow that is an easy row in overcoming. There is no one who has so much overcoming done that this they can sail through this. They are still actually and currently dealing with the forces that currently would prohibit them from accomplishing this overcoming. And that's a daily thing, it's a moment by moment thing which I deal with, which they deal with. When you are in this environment and those minds in opposition to our Father's kingdom surround us, then we, we deal with those influences on a regular basis. And we have to win round 
by round in that fight and in that struggle until we know we can keep them at bay. So readiness does not necessarily mean ease is ahead. It's almost as if sometimes the more ready you are, the harder the influences pounce on you. Because it's like the influences see that you're about to get to the point where you're secure, and therefore they have to add extra uh, influences to prohibit you from accomplishing the closeness that you want with the next level as it relates, connects with your older member or your teacher. Did that cover our question there? Yes, it did. Okay, are we ready to go to the next one? Jim, what's next on our list? Uh, is timing a factor in readiness for overcoming? Okay, timing. Timing is a factor from a couple of important uh, points. One, if we think of timing, it was, let's go back 2,000 years. The, Jesus knew when he delivered his message to his disciples that they had to respond then. They had to get, he was there. He was a representative, don't forget, of the next level. He was a representative of his father's kingdom. He took up on a human vehicle. He became a begotten son instead of a made son because he of uh, having a next level vehicle. He was in a human form and he was a representative sent to bring them information of how to get from human level to level above human. And so timing was important. He was present. Therefore, if you want to make that transition, you have to do it during the time a lab instructor is there to take you through it. And therefore, as he taught them and said to them, do this, do this, you follow me, you believe in me, you do exactly as I say, and you'll get there. You will not know death. Wow. But I can't get there and not know death unless I continue to believe and continue to do. Okay, timing. So timing is very important from the aspect of responding when a representative has been sent with the offering of transition from human kingdom into the level above human. Timing is also important from other aspects. The time that it takes me to get out of, to break the ties that bind, to get out of my humanness and get on with my program. That timing is very important. Another aspect of timing that's important is I can't just say, well, it seems that the next level sends representatives periodically, and it looks as if, if I don't get X amount of overcoming done this time, then there'll be a time down the line. I'm afraid we have no assurance of that. Uh, we have no data to that. We have no knowledge of that. I mean, if you want to gamble to that degree, that's like saying, you know, if I'm going to win a million dollars at the Vegas table, then I'll, w I'll win it next month. Uh, not while the Vegas table is advertising that a million dollars can be won. Because when the information is there, it's being offered. It's being advertised to an extent. That's what these tapes are doing. They're letting, the inf they're letting you know the information is available. The, trans the door is open. So I have to respond while the door is open if I expect to move through the door or even get a toe in the door or even start in that or maybe even get through the door and get it slammed if I get enough overcoming done. So I certainly can't take the frame of mind that this is something that I can do at a later time or I can count on a rep being here at another time. So timing is important when the representative is present. The timing is important on when I recognize this truth, I need to get rid of the shackles that bind me with, rid of those things that are inhibiting me from getting into the classroom and getting on with this program, if it is for me. And that's not for us to say, that's for you to say. But if that is what you are saying, then we must remind you that timing is significant and that you need to act quickly. Did that cover that topic? Well, when there's no member of the next level present on the garden, is it more appropriate for them to be humanitarians? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. And 
I would say that when there is no representative present, that it is a justifiable position for being the best human you know how to be. Now, if a soul is present during the time that a representative is not present, a soul who knew a representative at a previous time, that soul still might make incre increased efforts at overcoming and thereby relate less and less to human responsibility and more and more in an attempt to become servant. More and more. And the humans would say, what's that person doing? He's copping out. He's becoming a hermit. He's dropping his responsibility to society. So if that soul knew that much knowledge and is present at that time, he might take that route and it is not our place to judge him or condemn him because we do not know what position he might find himself in or what his previous experience was. But if, if he was not that close, then the, probably the best thing that he can do is become charita charitable-minded, uh, humanitarian, do the best that he can to make a significant contribution to society, whether it's in medicine or science or whatever it might be, to try to better things, to clean up the environment or things that would take better care of the garden and try to stimulate people more toward uh, better conduct than certainly negative or destructive conduct that makes the world a more difficult place for other people. Did that answer that question? Yes. Thank Glenn, you. where are we on our next question? Well, we've certainly touched on this, but is the message that we have the same message that Jesus brought? Well, we have to directly address that question. Yes. I think we've probably said that before, but we need to say it again. It's the same message exactly. Don't forget what we just said just a moment ago, is that what was Jesus' purpose while he was here? He sent his disciples out and he told them, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was at hand through me. You do this through me. You believe in me. You do as I say. You can get there. Now this one, because Jesus said, I'm big boy. I'm big shot. I'm Mr. God. He was saying that, I have been commissioned to act as midwife to you. I'm no big shot in the eyes of, our, of my heavenly Father. I'm no big shot in the heavenly kingdom. It is my task to be there to minister to you. And if I can minister to you, then you can make it there. But he still had to be the object of their focus. He was given. He was the vessel for the information on how to make the transition from human kingdom into level above human. And therefore, we have to listen to the vessel when the vessel is present. We can't ignore the vessel, just take the information and run and say, I can do it on my own. It doesn't work. Because what is it? There's another thing that enters in here. That information as it comes changes daily. This vessel is not giving you information that it got from its older member when its older member was in a human vehicle. This vessel is giving you information that it receives day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, from its older member. And if I'm not in a position to receive that information, which, now that information is not like some, you know, super duper, holy, holy, sanctimonious information. It is practical application of how I overcome my binds, my shackles, my addictions, my improper behavior, my improper conduct that was okay in the human kingdom because it was transitioned from animal kingdom, but which is not okay if I expect to ever get in my father's house without running him out the back door. So it's simply practical lab instructor type relationship with the students and trying to help their souls clean up their act, get rid of their humanism, adopt the ways. Actually, they're not just getting rid of humanism. They're not just breaking the binds to the human kingdom. They are 
adopting ways of the next level. They are taking on ties with the next level. They are taking on habits of the next level. They have a different structure, they have a different format than human uh, ties would or human uh, habits. But they are trying to graft to the next level. They're trying to graft so that when they get into that kingdom, they fit. It can work. Even though they're tiny little children in that kingdom level, it's okay. I mean, you know, they might wet their diaper, they might make little boo-boos, but it's, it's permissible. They can handle it. It's tolerable. It's not going to be so difficult that those who they work with, are, it's like getting into a team. It's like getting into a crew, whether it's a crew aboard a spacecraft or a crew in a project to prepare a garden for its next civilization. But how can the crew function if members of that crew still have to, well, I've got to have so-and-so to consume because I don't like what's offered here, or I've got to uh, have some time by myself. I've got to go sit and meditate a little bit. I, I mean, if it requires all that attention, then that individual can't really be a crew member, can't be a spoke in the wheel, can't be a, just an active tool of the captain of that task or the instructor for that task. Where were we? I think was we covered that. There was the, our message is the same as the message Jesus brought. Okay. All right. What's next on our list, Jim? Did you want to discuss the name of Jesus, Yeshua? Okay, this is an interesting uh, little thing to talk about. The name of Jesus. Um, when, don't forget that when Jesus was present, he said, do this in my name. And he said, uh, now that had a couple of different meanings. One was, uh, you can blame me for it. Whatever it is they're going to, problem they're going to give you, go ahead and blame me for it. In other words, he knew that his task was going to end with the masses requiring his life and stringing him up in one way or another. And he said, you know, that's part of the MO of my task, so I'll take the blame. You know, you can say, he told me to do it. So do it in my name. Another thing is that he, if you look to him and if you're saying calling his name all the time in your head and in your thoughts, asking for help, then he can respond. His father can respond. His father wanted you to call his name of the son. His father put his son in the position so you could call his name and that you could get closer and closer. The more Jesus meant to those who were his disciples and his followers, the closer they got. Also, the more lessons they got, the more correction they got, the more help they got. But it was a point of contact. It was a point of communication. It was a point of focus to call his name. Now, the name also, according to some of the linguists and historians, had some double meaning, and some use the term Yeshua, meaning present Savior. Well, Jesus as a representative of the kingdom of heaven or the next level, present with information of how to get from the human kingdom into the kingdom above human, was he not present? And was he not their Savior, therefore their present Savior? And therefore that name had significance for him, the Yeshua our present Savior. Unfortunately, that puts this vehicle on the spot right now, too. I happen to be, or this vessel happens to contain, and this soul happens to contain and be the conduit for that information that can get you from the human kingdom into the kingdom above human. And I'm afraid that Jesus is not my name. Jesus was the name of that vehicle. And we need to understand it that way. Uh, let me help you understand something a little more. Jesus said, don't forget, 
that if someone says to you in the age to come, when, when he meant the age to come or he meant the end of the age, the end of the age, that he is here or he is there or you can find him on this mountain or wherever it was, don't believe him. Jesus knew that he would not come appearing as Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand me and say that that's what I'm saying I am, and you'll understand that in a moment. He says, don't believe it. For someone to say that that's who they are is, doesn't make sense. It isn't right. For a couple of reasons. One is that Jesus, or the soul that was in the vehicle that was named Jesus, that soul certainly had grown to the point of not wanting identity any longer. He wanted to draw attention to his kingdom, to his father even though his father had said, the part of the formula that I give you is that they must look to you. They must call your name. But here, understand something else. What was the name of that soul? Was it the name of that soul? Was that Jesus? No. That soul had a name before it entered the vehicle that was named Jesus. You don't know that name. I don't know that name. I'm not supposed to know that name. I think I certainly knew it before I came into this lifetime as my older member certainly knew it, but it is not to be brought in. It is secret. You know, when Jesus, don't forget when Jesus left them and was telling them how to pray after his departure, it was to the group, to the ones who were close to him, it was our Father, Father, our Father, who art in heaven, which was, who art in the next level now, having left this place, hallowed be thy name, kept holy, thy name kept holy. It's, humans are not to know the names of individuals in the next level, or in the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God. You know, these Biblical scholars who dig and dig and dig and they finally get smart and they come up with Yahweh or Yahweh or this or that, all these different names for Jehovah the this and Jehovah the that. And they're forgetting the first rules that the names of those individuals from the next level who related to the humans, which they did in the early days of migration from Egypt and to Israel and all that time, they were physically there in next level vehicles and they had titles. And those titles then became names. Their names were not to be known. Now, if humans lucked out somehow or other by their, their biblical scholarship, so to speak, and, and came across and discovered what the name might have been of that member of the next level that was present at that time, then I'm sure that the next level they would change that name of that soul because humans are not to call the names. They can call the titles, they can call the stations, they can make reference to in their prayers those whom they have known who, while they were present on earth. There's certainly it is appropriate for humans to do the best that they can as they seek to relate to that kingdom. The best that they can is to pray to God, to pray to Jesus, to what else can they do? That's the best that they can do. And it serves the purpose. You know, it's not really what name you use at the front of your prayer that counts. It's what your prayer is that counts. If you are saying God, or if you're saying Jesus, or whatever it is that you're saying, if you're saying, I want what you want for me. I want to join you. I want to overcome this world. I want to become as you. I want to become as your son. I want to Leave everything that separates me from you. 
If they simply said one thing, lead me closer to you and help me to rise to the occasion. Because in the process of asking that you be led closer to, things will be put in your path that will begin to challenge that statement that you've just made. Because if you ask, lead me closer to you, and then the one who responds begins to give you an opportunity to drop some shackle or some tie or some bind to the human kingdom, how are you going to respond? Say, oh God, how could this have happened to me? God, please restore this. And he says, oh, I thought you wanted to get closer to me. Oh, God, please restore it. Okay, I'll send somebody who can restore it. I'm not in the business of restoring humanism, but I'll send somebody who will if that's what you really want. So when we say, I want to get closer to you, we've got to take what comes in response to that. Where were we? Would, are you, you, would you say that our disciplines are the same disciplines that Jesus taught? I hope so. <laughs> yes, I believe that I can say with confidence because I know my Father. I know how my Father's example works. I know that when my Father tells me that I can overcome something and tells me how to overcome it, overcome it and then continues to bring me a new clue, a new band-aid, a new remedy, or try something else, try something else, I know that if I continue to do what is given to me, that it works. Therefore, our discipleship is the same. When Jesus said to his disciples, or to those who would be his disciples, unless you hate your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, read that to us, Jim. Read us that uh, scripture. If any man comes to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Okay. The popular thing to do in the Christian world is to say, oh, he didn't really mean that. What he really meant was, uh, if you love those things more than me. And I'd say that that is an appropriate application when a representative is not present. But when the transition information and discipline is available, which it was in Jesus' time. Therefore, he had the right to say to them, come and follow me. Leave those things and come and follow me. Give up everything that you have of this world. Get rid of it. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Leave everything, and as you leave them, they will become your enemies. Even your family will become your enemies. He knew it. It hurt. He couldn't. There is no way around it. It happens. It's the natural way of transition from kingdom level to kingdom level. The door is the same. The knob twists the same way. It's got the same hazards. It's just as difficult today as it was then. It's just as easy today as it was then. It's the same door. It's the same transition. It is changing our behavior. It is dropping everything that binds us to the human kingdom dropping everything of possessions. You know, within this classroom, we don't have possessions. It's, this classroom is, don't forget, a transition. This is a chrysalis. This is where we get, where we go through the change from human into that level. So anytime that we have a possession, it's because we ask a class member who really doesn't want any possessions, we say, well, law says that you got to, somebody's name has to go on the title of this or on the title of that, whether it be an automobile or what it might be. Someone who does not want to have any possessions, it seems that we get instruction that it's okay to put their name on that possession. Since the day that my father touched my life and my awakening began, I've had no possessions. My older member had no possessions. Not one thing in our names. Nothing that could be considered ours. 
We don't want anything of ours. That's the last thing we want is anything of ours. And they aren't handing out any titles to possessions in the kingdom of heaven right now that we're aware of, certainly in our transition classroom. There are no titles there. There are no, there is no ownership. Actually, there shouldn't be any here in the human kingdom. This kingdom and every element on it, everything that goes into make an automobile or a house or a company or anything else, belongs to the chief of chiefs and his kingdom, the God of gods. It does not belong to humans. Humans play a little game of copycat by saying, I want to own this. I want to stake this off. It's mine. It isn't his. He's just playing a game. Now, if he has the attitude that it isn't mine, he's at least a little closer. If he has the attitude of saying, this is just entrusted me because, as a keeper of it and I'll do the best I can and as the day comes. But whoops, when a representative is there with the transition available, the day has come. If you're someone who might be capable of connecting with this and know your Father. If you know Jesus, you know this is truth. You may have an idea that you know Jesus, but the Jesus that you have filled your head with and all the little sayings that you quote, all the little scriptures that you quote are the safe ones. And you usually quote Paul, who didn't even know him, never even sat with him, never talked to him. You know, if you'd stick to the red letters, you'd be better off. But even among the red letters, if you'd go to the ones that are pertinent, like the all-important ones, the bottom line ones, the ones that not, this is not to say to you that this is what you must do. This is only what those must do that are ready for this, that know it is for them. But if we would go and know that it's always the same. The transition is always the same. If I expect to want to get into my father's house, into that kingdom level, out of the human kingdom, I can't do it after I die by trying to get good in the last six months before I kick the bucket. I mean, I can't overcome anything then, you know. My, my vehicle has grown so old and so tired and so sick, the influence is already even around to be interested in me to even have the things I need to get rid of. So... It's difficult. Let's go on. What's the next question on our list? How is the behavior within our monastery or shelter attempting to be like the behavior, the behavior in God's house? Well, uh, I think we've talked about that, but we'll touch on it a moment more. Don't forget, I'm a lab instructor, so to speak. Therefore, our classroom or our chrysalis is a lab. And in that lab, we try to assimilate what it would be in our father's house. Now, I don't really believe there's any Gothic architecture in our father's house. I don't believe there are bells and robes and, and rituals and incense and all those things. It's practical. It's a laboratory. It's experiments. It is behavior that is pleasing in his sight. It is being servants of his in whatever task he has that we might be able to perform depending upon our degree of readiness or overcoming or not interfering with what he has in mind. So we do try in our classroom to have an assimilation or a analogy, a mock-up of his house, his kingdom. So we try to live that as we are here. And the closer we get, we then recognize, wow, this is, the environment becomes something that I must say to those who are in the classroom when they have to go on this task and that one outside the classroom and they get back in, it's like, wow, I can breathe again. Because within the confines of wherever our segment of classroom is, within the confines of the environment that is our assimilated laboratory of his house. And the behavior has become what it has. It is our haven. It is our heaven, our assimilated heaven. 
in that sense, we are beginning to experience some of the feeling that is present. And believe me, not believe me, it is not a a righteous, you know, uh, spiritual, uh, syrupy, saccharine. It's practical. It's hard work. It's correction. It's learning. Uh, day by day more things that I need to correct that I haven't yet faced and how I can apply more application toward overcoming those things than I applied before. And new clues are given to me so that I can stamp them out even more. And that's the formula for an overcoming classroom. That's the formula. Therefore, we do, within our possibility, try to create as according to our instruction. It's not that we try to create. We feel instruction is given to us on how to create an assimilation of our father's house, our laboratory, however you want to look at it. The uh, tech crew just uh, said that it's a couple of minutes before the uh, end of the hour, and I'm going to ignore it, ignore it, and we're just going to go on until this session is complete within reason, depending upon how far we go with this session. Let's go to our next question. Glenn? Did we want to discuss how some might think, because you're our teacher, that you're on a spiritual ego trip or think you're God? Yes, I think we've discussed that a little bit, but we can certainly touch on it a little bit more. Um, I don't know what you think that Jesus had to gain from a human point of view by saying that he was sent from the kingdom of heaven and was the son of his father and had information that flowed through him on how to get from here to there. I mean, if you thought that of him, if you were present then and thought that of him, you didn't know him. You didn't know what he was all about. I mean, what did he have to gain? He, he had to gain total ridicule. He had to gain... Uh, the masses hating him. He had to gain a cross. He had to gain nails. He had to gain a, a tomb. He had to gain every humiliation that could be expected. He even warned his students and his disciples that that was ahead for them. They had to take up their cross, come and follow him. They had to know that that same humiliation would follow them. He knew that the possibility of the masses ever recognizing this and I mean it's, it would like deplete the human kingdom if the masses and the human kingdom don't forget is a stepping stone from animal kingdom to our father's kingdom even though it's a little hard to understand but uh, it's tough it's it puts yourself in a position where if you happen to be the rep they, they're going to say, oh, are you saying you're Jesus? And so we have to face that and say, well, no, I'm not. And uh, uh, the one who was Jesus wasn't even Jesus before he took the vehicle that was Jesus. And I'm not Jesus. That's not my name. The name of this vehicle, you can look it up in the records if you want to, but take a, we take a name that doesn't mean anything because the name we really have is one we can't tell you anyhow because we don't even know what it is because it's a next level name. But and so the critics then say, oh, but you're just saying that you're God. Well, in a sense, if you're saying that we're saying we're from the kingdom of God and it has many members, yes, we're from the kingdom of God. Yes, we're from the next level. It has many members. But the truth also, as we mentioned a moment ago, is that from where I sit, I'm a young'un because I don't relate to any who evolutionarily are, came later than this soul came from. My relationship as far as my concern for my growth and what is ahead for me and my relationship with the kingdom of God, my relationship with the next level, goes from where I am up. And therefore, I'm low man on totem pole. Even though my task is to relate to those souls that are coming through. But that task of relating to them is not such a unique task that it took a highfalutin uh, officer in the next level in order to perform it. Who knows, there could be many members of that 
kingdom level in my father's house who might be able to perform this. But the task was given, not only given to this soul and the vehicle that is surrounding this soul. Listen, I, as we've described to you before, I and this class had the unique, unbelievable privilege of even having my father accompany me in the early stages of this classroom. Awaken me. Help me through the rough spots because of what the world had become at this time. Now, maybe it's because I needed that help. Maybe Jesus didn't need that help 2,000 years ago. Or maybe the world wasn't that complicated at that time. I don't know the reasons. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I suspect that Jesus had even a physical relationship with his father during the time that he was there that didn't reach the history books, that didn't reach the scripture. But I was still so lucky and so privileged to have my father come and awaken me, set this thing up, get it going. You know, I don't know that you can relate to this at all. You probably can't. <laughs> it just means so much to me. But I can remember in the first few weeks that I met T, that T said, uh, why do I feel that this is something that I'm to give to you and then I'm to go back? And I didn't know what she was talking about. But I know now. And I'm even thankful that it was designed that way. Because I am the beneficiary even of that difficulty. We're all beneficiaries of difficulties. If our desire is to get closer, what's the formula? A difficulty <laughs> comes our way. A hurdle, a means of getting rid of misinformation or getting rid of things that are still human ways of thinking, and we can overcome that and move forward. I forgot where we were. Where were we? Well, I don't Clint? know. Do you feel like we covered the uh, fallacy of thinking that Jesus is God or that he's the only begotten son in what you just said? Well, uh, you know, for those who, for those preachers, evangelists, religious leaders who say that Jesus is God is ridiculous. I hate to say that, but it's ridiculous. A, a member of the kingdom of God, absolutely he was. That soul was a member of the kingdom of God. But to use the term God in reference is like another term for using the top man, the creator of creators, the very one who is the king at the top of that kingdom level. Now, whether or not the evolutionary level above human has any evolutionary levels above it, or if only above the evolutionary level above human is pyramided in a sense, or peaks at a sense by the Creator, the Chief of Chiefs, the God of Gods, God Almighty, doesn't really matter. But to say that Jesus was God shows ignorance. Jesus was the Son of His Father. He fulfilled that task in the sense that it was his father's mind flowing through him. And if we want to refer to his father as God, then it was God expressing himself through him. As it came down through the pipelines through Jesus' father, Jesus' father's father, and so forth from the one who initiated that information or passed it down. Because that is the structure of the family tree in the next level, are the kingdom of God. What was the other part of that one? Um, that Jesus was the only begotten son? The only begotten son. That's interesting because begotten son meant that that particular father probably had other students or sons and that Jesus was present in a human vehicle, a vehicle that came from woman's womb, therefore a begotten vehicle, and therefore a begotten son. Begotten, not made. Made meaning 
created or developed within the kingdom of heaven instead of from the womb of woman. So in that sense, the, begot the only begotten son, that's right, was the only son who was present in a begotten flesh. And that's an important, I mean, it's not going to get you into the kingdom of heaven to know that information. It's just a little tidbit that's kind of interesting. <laughs> okay, what's next, Jim? Did you want to mention the response that we've had since we started a few weeks ago? Yes. You know, this is, has been um, surprising to us. We, we're always surprised. We think that when we get new information that it's going to mean this, it's going to imply that and these things are going to follow and it's always different from what we expect. What is particularly interesting is that as the information came out and tapes were made and a satellite series was uh, begun and uh, posters went out about that information, we thought that the response that we would get was from people who the information was new to. But the overwhelm overwhelming immediate response that we got was from ones who had dropped out of the classroom previously. And immediately when the information reached them by whatever source, and they were drawn to it, but when it reached them, they said, I, I've got to get back into that classroom. I've got to finish my overcoming if I am permitted to get back into that classroom. I know I've wasted time. I know I have lost ground. And we're amazed because our population has almost increased 50% by returnees from those who had dropped out of the classroom previously. It's interesting because from this point of view, from the point of view of those organizations that would give help to deprogram cult members, you would have thought that those who dropped out of our classroom would have, I mean, these have, who've been out, they've been out extended periods of time, years. Uh, you would have thought that they could have, they wouldn't want any part of this any longer. This isn't to say that some who dropped out do not want any part of this any longer. And we can understand that point of view in defense of where their heart is, where they, what they desire. But I'm afraid that it also says something for us that we should recognize. This is not to praise us. This is to recognize the reality that has been given us to give to you, to find that those members of our class who dropped out, they couldn't deny this truth. And you know, a funny thing about it is that many of them thought they could complete their overcoming outside the classroom. And yet, as they turned and looked in the mirror and saw what they were doing, they recognized that they weren't getting anywhere with that overcoming. Instead, they were sliding back and sliding back. And they realized that the fact is still true that it takes a midwife who has gone through it before, who has made that transition from human stepping stone into the level above human before in order to take you through it. Because it's, don't forget, the instructions come daily. Everything changes in practical application to your own overcoming. So the response we had was mainly those who were re returnees. And we welcomed them, and they, they were embarrassed. They were ashamed for their lost time. And we're just thrilled that they want to complete what they started. And they know that it was true then. They never really lost sight of it. And they're excited that it is offered to them again. Now, or that they can complete what they started. Now, I said most of our response has been those, and our population has almost increased 50% in a very short time, a matter of a few weeks. We have received some who are working toward getting in the classroom, in other words, quickly making their preparations to join in a segment of the classroom, wherever that segment is. And they are also a surprise to us because they, instead of being someone who is hearing this information for the first time in a disconnected way, they are all ones who have heard the connection from either because another family member was in the classroom 
or because they had some association or relationship with someone who was in the classroom or who was a dropout of the classroom and they received enough whatever it was beginning little you know smelling salts or something that now that the door opened they said i've got i've got to attempt that if that classroom would accept me i want to attempt that so without exception those who are coming into our classroom at this time are those who are returnees and a few several who have are either family members or who have had relationships of one sort or one sort or another with those who are in the classroom or who were out of the classroom for a period of time did that cover that topic Ken? yes okay Jim where do we go next do we still feel that the monastery MO of wherever two or more overcomers are, um, is it adequate or will they need uh, a hands-on classroom? Well, we have to address that because we thought that when we first put the tapes out and said, you know, remember that a Total Overcomers Anonymous, or if you want to be a part of this transition, if you want to consider yourself a member of our monastery, if you want to consider yourself an overcomer, that that can happen where two overcomers are, and we will help you to the best of our ability. Well, you know what happened? We spent hours and hours daily on the telephone with those who responded, and it wasn't enough, and they didn't want to be where they were. They didn't want to remain in that environment. We also assigned different partnerships to write letters to those who wrote in and said this is what they wanted to do and by the time they got their letters they were just frustrated and and we were moving on to something else and it, it just simply wasn't working so I'm afraid the fact is or not afraid the fact is that they have to actually to our surprise physically join a segment of the classroom our monastery our shelter and have a hands-on laboratory uh, participation so that they can get accelerated help in overcoming. So we had to adjust to that, and we're still adjusting to that because it's a difficult task to take care of any significant response when it requires that much physical connection with individuals who are desperate to move as quickly as they can move and recognizing what they have to overcome. Did that complete that question, yes. Jim? Where are we now? What's next, Glenn? Did you want to mention more about how many and where the returnees and new class members are coming from and the variety of their ages and backgrounds? Well, we'll say just a word of that. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting to note that some of those who were out and, uh, and, and some of those who, oh, like we have one person who had been out of the classroom for some time and has to get back in and while out married this individual and they're both in their 70s and that person has to get back in the classroom and the person they married has to get in the classroom they know that the well, funny thing is that their marriage had already become one that was and not because of their age had already become one of of not a physical relationship in the way that you normally would think or that humans think of a of a marriage circumstance and but that's interesting to realize that here comes a husband up there in their 70s and we've got another husband and their wife in Northern California we've got uh, we've got them coming from Missouri uh, Texas um, where am I missing Venezuela Venezuela <laughs> and uh, here is here is a soul that has been looking for this classroom that got separated from his classroom in the mid 70s and has faithfully been looking for this classroom since then. And we have met with him, helped him understand more clearly all over again what it was going to require of him and what he was getting into since it was so tough. And he says, I have no choice. And so he's quickly wrapping up everything in Venezuela and he's on his way. Did I miss any others that you're aware of from Colorado? Colorado. So we've got. Missouri, Colorado, California, Texas, Venezuela. That, at present, that's where people 
are coming in. And it's interesting that more than one from those different places. Uh, the only one that one of them coming is from Venezuela. It's more than one from those other places mentioned. Let's go on to the next question. Jim, where are we? Did we want to discuss the problem with delivering our information to the public? Okay, the problem there is that we're aware of the hazards. In other words, here we are offering this information out. Anybody can turn on their satellite TV and see this. Anybody can see a poster. And we're aware that the masses can see it who aren't ready for this. And therefore, in principle or theory, we're opening the information to the public at large. And it also means that more than likely, greater numbers will be not wanting to do this than those, <laughs> significantly than those who would want to do this. And also that those who do not want to do this and who don't, do not even recognize us as an opportunity to do this uh, will find fault with us and will create the same kind of circumstance that happened 2,000 years ago. Now, we're not saying that there's going to be a, a crucifixion. and We don't know how it's going to end. We don't know as much as Jesus do toward the end of his. We do know that um, hostility builds, particularly when the doors are open. Because, you know, as long as we had a period of time where the classroom was in somewhat isolation and protected and they were working on their own uh, overcoming before we got information to, to or instruction to bring the information public again, um, the forces against us didn't work that uh, significantly against us. We were protected. But now that we are, we're just putting this <laughs> information right out where all of those who are brainwashed with the misinformation from the negative forces, they're having a chance to hear it too, which is going to be an opportunity for them to get their bows and arrows out and really be after us to whatever degree that they choose. That's their option. Okay, so that's our problem with dealing with the public. What's next, Then, Why is the most puritanical lifestyle so vehemently uh, criticized by the religious and the seemingly righteous? Well, is it because they might know that it's the truth <laughs> subconsciously? I don't know. It's a good question. It's interesting, too, that why in some countries uh, it's such an honor for individuals to join, uh, join a monastic order, to leave everything, break all their ties, even their relationship entirely with their family, and, and devote themselves to their religion, it becomes acceptable. But the closeness has been in this nation, primarily in this nation since 75. And therefore, this nation is also the most vehement against anything that even hints of separating from the world. And therefore, that's the reason there's such enormous criticism against cults and things that uh, appear to be out of the ordinary. When, you know, stop and think about it. Don't forget that when Jesus was doing what he was doing, that he and his disciples were a cult from the human point of view or from those who did not believe that what he said was true. That's always the position they take. It's a cult. We've got to save them from it. And, I mean, if you take the point of the leader in the cult, then the one who still says that he is the leader is the Pope still not in a position of being the leader of a cult? Is the president of the Mormon church not still in a position of being the leader of a cult in that sense? But you know, the funny thing happens, as long as they're buying property and doing human behavior and they're a generation or two old, then they become an acceptable member of society. It's when they are breaking out of society, overcoming the world, to whatever degree that they get immediately seen as offensive. Offensive to whom? To those who cannot recognize this as the truth. By their choice, by what they have become. Whether they are taking that point of view because they are young and might grow into that knowledge at some time, or because it's just a simply a result of their options over a period of time, that's not for us to say. We are not the judge of that. What's next on our list of questions? How is the next level the greatest equal rights advocate? That's a good question. You know, and this is a good point because um, equal rights. You know, the creator of creators created 
everyone with a little computer, a little soul that was designed with two sides, a potential for negativity, a potential for positive, a potential, a potential for misinformation, a potential for the truth, and a soul in an objective point at its point of creation was 50-50. It was empty, but it had the potential for 50-50, which it could take the choices of. Like even that soul that was in the Garden of Eden, the Lord made it clear that he was his Lord, he was his God, and he said, you do what I say, then you know, you go right away. But he also knew that the likelihood of him going astray was very possible. And I know that it, has, it hurt his feelings when he had to step out of that garden, knowing that for the period of time he was away from them, that the man of information would step in and say, oh, you don't have to worry about what he said. You don't have to worry about disobeying him. Go ahead and eat this and, and do what I tell you. It's, you know, it's, it's for your benefit. He's not anything to be afraid of. That was their choice. They were created with a complete, even, fair option of accepting goodness, making the choice toward listening to him or listening to misinformation. Now, our Father's kingdom is never the aggressor. He doesn't say, this is what you must do. Or this side over here, they tell you what you got to do. They, they impose it upon you. You got to do it. That's the way it is in the human kingdom. Why is it designed that way? Our Father designed it. He even designed that aspect of it. He even made all that potential for negativity there. So that if you get to his kingdom, in the process you will have overcome all that negativity. You will be strong. You will have proven your loyalty into his adoption of his household, grafting to his vine. So... Uh, equal rights. You know, one time when I, within our classroom, and I think that we've told you this in previous series, we had a class member who uh, at one time said, please, under no circumstances, let me ever turn from this. Save me if I ever try to turn from this. And T and I listened to that class member, and at one time that class member said, I don't want to be here. And so we honored what she had asked, and we held her for a short period of time. We tried to restrict her from leaving the classroom. We saw it wasn't working. She wasn't, I mean, in a very short time, we saw it wasn't working. She wasn't what we would consider coming back to her senses, so we said, goodness, go. We'll help you go. Here, here's a plane ticket. Go where you want to go, and we'll help you get started with whatever it is that you've got to do. You know the irony of that? We did that one time, and one time only. We learned our lesson from it. That same individual is arriving in a segment of our classroom next week saying, I've got to be there. I've got to finish what, I'm, what I started. I apologize for having ever listened to the world, for being so stubborn as to not take correction and to not change. So no one has a right. It is not next level way to hold someone from their choices. It is the next level way to let them go, become as evil as they want to be. Now, a next, next level member might step in and warn them, and warn them and warn them, but they let them go right on and do what they choose to do. It is the equal rights. It is the creator of equal rights. No one advocates equal rights to the extent of the next level. And our classroom tries to emanate that, tries to be the same way with it, trying to hope that if this is for you, we can help you. We hope we can be the vessels to have you, to, to deliver it to you clearly enough that you can see what it is that has been given to us that we're so eager to share with you. If it is not for you, we say, fine, go your way, do what you want to do. We might warn you of some of the pitfalls, but they're your choices. Go and do it. What's next on our list? Did we want to discuss the problem of money in relationship to the newcomers? No, but we will. <laughs> the reason this is such an awkward topic is the, uh, well, I have to make reference to it. You know, when Jesus said, go and give everything you have to the poor and come follow me. And I can remember T saying to me and to the classroom in early stages that 
I don't know if Jesus ever said it, but we knew that he probably wished that they would take a look at the classroom and say, are they not poor? If I can help them some, could I not help them? Because uh, as those who are leaving their world behind and entering the classroom, at times we wish we could say, uh, 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 um, in leaving behind whatever it is that you had, uh, you might keep in mind that we have certain needs. And you know, then we sound like we're begging for a handout or, or that our Father's kingdom can't take care of his own and our Father's kingdom t can take care of his own. And so we're left in that awkward position and we cannot take the position of telling them or even reminding them or bringing it to their attention. Even though frequently some after they, or when they get in the classroom, they think after getting in the classroom, oh, I could have, I see that you could have used one of these or one of those. And I had one of those. I gave it away to somebody who didn't. Oh, you know, but it's an awkward thing. We can't do it. I mean, they are not in our classroom until they are in our classroom. So when they are not in our classroom and they're severing their ties in order to enter our classroom, we can't give them instruction. They must do what they must do in order to separate from the world. We must have you understand that because that is our position, that is the next level's position. And we certainly are not um, dependent upon this world or are asking it for help in order to survive. We will survive according to the next level as we serve them and please them. What's next on our questions? Um, how do these items uh, relate to overcoming uh, religion? Well, why don't you give me the definition of religion as what the dictionary would say religion is? Belief in and reverence for a supernatural power accepted as the creator and governor of the universe. Well, at times, because of what so-called religions are, at times we feel like that we don't want to associate with that term because we want to say that the truth that we have is real, it's not a religion, because religions have become fantasy and illusion, and they've adjusted all their thinking so that they don't have to do anything about changing. But in that interpretation, recognizing a supernatural power, a governor of all that is, uh, we are certainly than a religion. What about church, Jim? What does it, what does the definition say on that? The company of all Christians regarded as a mystic spiritual body. Well, then I'm afraid that we're that too. Uh, but we're not mystic in that sense, or spiritual in that sense, because spiritual and mystic in this day and time has become less than true. It's become tainted. But, you know, the church says the body of believers, and we feel like that's a closer translation of what the church should be. But the real church is not just the body of believers, it's the body of doers. Or even more than that, it's the body of overcomers. Because those who believe become overcomers. What's next on that list? Well, you asked us to bring up how a television preacher, Gene Scott, relates to overcoming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to talk for a moment about Gene Scott and Pastor Arnold Murray. Gene Scott in Los Angeles has a satellite ministry, a cable ministry, a, an actual church ministry. Pastor Murray has one in a uh, satellite ministry a, a, uh, from a little community in Missouri. Both of these individuals did a major step in overcoming by stepping out of the mainstream of denominationalism. And it was hard to do. They got criticized a lot for it, which is the way of overcoming. Each step of overcoming is hard to do, and you get criticized for doing it. Let's take Gene Scott for a moment. Nobody that I'm aware of on the face of the globe has worked harder or come up with better mathematical and historical and intellectual and logical validation of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus the Son, the prophetic events, their sequence of events in disclosing the, the uh, pyramid and what 
they tell symbolically, the prophecy that they reveal. I mean, uh, it took a lot of work to do that and validate all that information and to make it understandable and academically acceptable. And, and we praise him uh, for that work. But the issue of issues when it comes to Jesus and his purpose here was that of getting from the human kingdom to the kingdom of heaven. And validation of prophecy, validation that the literature of the Bible is real and is true, sure, that's significant. It doesn't get you any marks in overcoming. I mean, overcoming is overcoming. It's hard tasks of changing your behavior, of dropping the ways of the world in all of its aspect, every tie that binds every behavior that is not acceptable. That is overcoming. Pastor Murray is also a very uh, astute, very aware biblical scholar. And if you want to watch him, watch him. You could learn a lot. You could learn a lot from both of those. They are excellent teachers of, of the Bible and its history and, and helping you understand some of the Pastor Murray understands that there was an age before this age, there's going to be an age after this age, and well, they, both of them, Scott and Murray, both realize that Jesus' birthday is not being celebrated, that it, that it happened at a different time. All that's very interesting information, but it doesn't get you anywhere in the process of overcoming. And for this, it's only because I love Pastor Murray and I love Gene Scott. And my older member said, bring them up in that tape. We're concerned for them and for their followers because they've made major strides in the right direction. And it's because we care for them that we hope that they will make more major strides and be willing, while it's still available, to move very quickly in that direction. What's next on that, Jim? What about the Florida end timers? Oh, that's <laughs> recently in the news there's been a lot of negative information going up out about this little group in northern Florida that call themselves end timers. And particularly toward their leader because he he feels that Jesus is gonna come at any moment and he wants he wants to help them be ready and so he's trying to help them change and to the best of his ability he has them involved in certain elements of trying to change their behavior and trying to be less worldly. And for that, we congratulate them. For that, we praise them. And uh, we hope that they will recognize that there is more information that can help them move much more quickly and much more significantly if they're ready for it. We hope that we can be good instruments to bring it to them if this is what they are looking for. If not, it's for those who are looking for it. What's next on our list? The ones who are looking for the second coming, but yet they're not doing any active overcoming, will they ever know him? Well, those who are looking for the second coming, will they ever know him? Huh, that's a loaded question. Um, as far as the second coming, mean when the, is the next level going to bring an open door again for the kingdom of heaven? The second coming is here. We've discussed that. And we've discussed how Jesus said, don't look for me. If somebody tells you they're me, don't believe them. And yet the information, the door is here at this time. Now whether or not they will know him or whether or not they will know his Father or they will know that kingdom is simply dependent upon whether or not they make it through the transition from the human kingdom into his kingdom level or into his house. Now whether or not it's going to be offered at another time, we don't know. All we know is this time. We're not given the instruction of saying, if you don't catch this bus, there's it one down the road. We don't know that there is. We feel that we must approach it as if there isn't that it's garden cleaning time. And what's going to be done with the souls that did not make it from there to here is none of our business. It's, we're not going to try to motivate you to do this out of that kind of, of fear and 
um, imposing that tribulation upon you. Your, your tribulation is going to be imposed upon yourself if you choose this way because it, you will recognize that this is true and recognize that the road is tough. What's next on our list? Did we want to mention again the domesticated pet analogy and how it uh, compares to our readiness to graduate from the human kingdom? Well, <coughs> we have to. Um, there is no better analogy. You know, uh, to me, the analogy of the, say, the domesticated dog who really wants to serve his master and doesn't want to run with the pack, wants to stay with his master, wants to please his master, wants to be loyal to his master. And seeing that as someone who is going through the transition of e entering our Father's kingdom, that they have to focal, that they have to use as a focal point of that, the one who stands in the position to be the object of that, unfortunately, happens to be their lab instructor, which happens to be this one sitting here, that we say dope. Um, you know, at this point, I have to tell you that this morning I saw on television a, um, a minister saying, bringing up adultery. This fellow from Memphis, I don't remember his name, but he was talking about adultery. When you are in line for getting into our Father's house, then if you sleep with anybody else to any degree, you are committing adultery from in the respect of our Father's house. I mean, this, that's the reason that the analogy in Revelation and elsewhere is of marriage. It's a bond that you're making. Now, don't misunderstand that. This lab instructor, this object of that has no interest in your plumbing, no interest in your sexuality. I mean, for heaven's sakes, my older member certainly had no interest in me, would not want that to that kind of humanness. Children are not made in our Father's kingdom in that way. That vibration is definitely a reproductive vibration of the human kingdom. And I can honestly say that any relationship of that nature certainly never happened with me and my older member, certainly has never happened with any of these class members and their older member. And if you find a class member that can tell you it has happened to any degree to either one of these lab instructors. You found the liar you were looking for. Because that is not a part of the picture. It has to be a pure relationship. It has to be within the confines of the behavior of our Father's kingdom. You know, so from our father's point of view, that when you are as a bride in his kingdom, then if your attention, if your affection and to any degree goes to someone else, it, it's adultery. It's compromised. Another show I saw this morning on satellite, but sure sounds like a lot of watch, watch a, lot, a lot of television. It's interesting how my older member frequently uses these little preachers in their lessons to Give me little clues of things to pass on to you. Here was an old gentleman that had had two wives. I suppose that one died and then he took another one. And now he was old. He was in, I think, in his 80s, late 70s or 80s. I don't remember which. But now he was saying of how he's, he's devoting his attentions totally toward his Lord, that he doesn't have to compromise it anymore. And yet, it doesn't dawn on others as they listen to him that what about others who are not in their late 70s or 80s? Are they still compromising their relationship? You know, when the commandment that says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, doesn't leave room for an affair. It doesn't leave room for promiscuity. It doesn't leave room for any sexuality, any disloyalty, any affection to any degree, to any source other than to 
the next level. And that must remain purely within the confines of appropriate behavior. You know, there's all the difference in the world between certain little behavior that seems like such a subtle difference. For example, a kiss on the cheek, a kiss on the forehead, in the right spirit can mean a very nice thing from my older member to me. Because it's done so rarely that when it's done, it's so special. But my older member wouldn't dirty my older member's mouth by pressing that mouth against this mouth and participating in things that would lower my vibrations, or hold this vehicle in a way that would stimulate lower vibrations of this vehicle. That, to the next level, is absolutely animal, absolutely a kingdom level beneath it. And you might as well know it. Whether you can accept it or not, that's your problem. But in all fairness, we must have you understand that. But for, you know, these, this little old man that I was telling you about who had had a wife and then had a wife and now he was old and they could give his whole time to his Savior, to Jesus. It's too late. He can't do any significant overcoming. He's not even connected with a midwife. I don't mean to condemn him. He may not be condemned. He might be salvaged for another time. I'm not judging him. I'm trying to help you understand. That same individual quoted some of the very, very significant scriptures, the ones that we say are the key bottom liners, the one that says, unless someone hate their mother, their father, the whole world, even their own life cannot even be my disciple. He said that. And he said, but Jesus didn't mean it in that way. He meant if they love those things more than me. They can love those things, but not more than me. I'm afraid he's mistaken. That would be appropriate interpretation of that when the next level has not come in close and made a physical presence. When the next level has made a physical presence, you're on the spot. And that spot says, if you know me, you don't share, you can't share, I'm not going to share, you can't be my wife and cheat on me. You can't compromise it, I'm the only one. I am the focal point, I am the object representing my Father's kingdom. You're moving into a crew consciousness, into a force of labor as a servant in our Father's kingdom that can't be distracted by lusts of the physical flesh or of the human flesh or of desires of the human flesh. That's the whole reason for overcoming, is to have you understand that. He also said that this thing, if you've got to give up everything of the world, break all those ties, give everything away to the poor, and come and follow me. He said, he didn't mean that. He said, just don't let it mean anything to you. That's not it. Those who are entering this classroom and this transition in order to become in our Father's house, they have to literally and physically leave everything behind and will not have anything from the time they do that until they get out of here. Whether it be with vehicle or without vehicle doesn't even enter into the picture. They are no longer possessors of anything, not that they could be even if they tried to be, but they don't even want to be. They don't even want to play those games, so they leave everything behind. Those relationships that won't let them do what they want to do, they have to sever those because they interfere. They get in their way. This is the requirement, was the requirement, is, always will be the requirement. Now, the last little thing that you must understand here is that once this information, if this information, if this world exists beyond our departure, to the extent that there is no longer that closeness, there is no longer a representative. Now, I am a physical representative. These of the classroom, they are physical representatives. Should I leave this classroom and return to my father's house? 
they would still be your door for whatever time one of them was still faithful wife, faithful in all behavior, faithful in all belief and practice, wanting, owning nothing of this world, establishing nothing of this world that could be called a church, a belief system that would be accepted by the masses. As long as one of them remains, your door is open. If that one remaining remains faithful to the full degree. It is our hope that this has been the next level, speaking through my older member into my brain and that I have not diluted it because I want you to see it as it is. Because I feel if you could actually see it as it is, you couldn't deny it. Even though I know that because of what you're addicted to, you're, you're, you don't want to be, but you're intoxicated and you're drunk, you're influenced, you're not sober because of the ways of the world that hold you in that intoxication. And that after you have to get away from the world enough to begin to be free of that intoxication. But I'm even hoping that your intoxication isn't so bad that you can see this. And certainly all who might, that the next level might deem deserving of entering their house, might see this enough to recognize that it is what they've been waiting for. The next level has to touch their life. The next level has to let them, something happen in their head that says, that's it, that's what I'm after. I've got to get there fast. I've got to go with it. And then it is our task to participate in that instruction, our task in the daily, daily menial tasks of overcoming, the reminders, the licking of thoughts, the licking of behavior that is human, not next level. Adopting the behavior the habits, the ways of the next level. We wish you could see it as we see it. We wouldn't trade it for anything. But we're not trying to sell it. I guess we are. Because it means so much to us. I feel that this is the end of this series beyond human. And I hope that we've been instruments of the next level through my Father and through our offering to you.